Greetings and welcome to worship at Bayshore Church. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. And we're certainly glad that you've joined us for today's online service. Today is the third Sunday in the season of Lent, and we will turn to the gospel according to John to hear and reflect upon the story of Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem when he turned over the tables of the money changers. As always, our musicians have prepared some special music to nourish you along your Lenten journey. And we hope that these services provide you with a way to set apart some time for prayer and worship in order to nurture your relationship with God in this holy season. Today we will be taking the Sacrament of Communion, so we do invite you to have some elements ready to represent the bread and cup for you. As we now prepare our hearts for worship, I invite you to join with me in prayer. All honor and glory are yours, O God. Your grace knows no limit and your love no end. You reach out your hand to heal and make whole, to comfort and to lift up. Your goodness is steadfast and your promise is sure from generation to generation. As we gather now to offer you our thanks and praise, may we be inspired, empowered, and strengthened to minister and serve with compassion and grace in your name. Amen. Our opening hymn today was translated into English by John Mason Neal. He was an unparalleled expert in translating hymns originally written in Latin or Greek, including familiar favorites such as All Glory, Laud, and Honor, and O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Today's hymn, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation, is a 6th century Latin hymn originally written for the dedication of a church. So today you'll be singing along with the saints as they have sung these words throughout the centuries. Join us in song. Marilyn Rupert. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle, and he poured out 
all of the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these out of here. Stop making my house a marketplace. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house shall consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you are going to raise it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May these words be blessed to our hearing and our understanding. This is the word of the Lord. Hi, Bayshore kids. I hope this finds you and your families well, and you're having a good week so far. So today I wanted to talk to you about our Bayshore Church Bond of Union. Did you know that we have a statement that helps us focus on what our church is all about? In fact, it's been a part of our church community since the 1940s. And the first line of our Bond of Union goes like this. Our Bond of Union in this church is a common loyalty to Jesus Christ. That makes sense, doesn't it? At church, we learn about Jesus, we do our best to follow his teachings together, and we do our best to live and love in the way that he did and taught us to. The next line goes like this. We believe that the Lord's whole requirement is to do justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. That's a quote from the prophet Micah. And those are important things that we focus on, don't we? seeking justice and fairness in the world, being kind and loving to those around us, and loving God with humble hearts. And you know, our relationship with God is really a lifelong relationship, isn't it? So it is a walk, it is a journey through all of our lives. The next line is we cherish for each person the fullest liberty in the interpretation of truth and we gladly grant others the freedom we claim for ourselves. You know, it's okay for us to not see everything exactly the same way and to have different ideas and differences of opinion. In fact, we can learn from each other and grow when we share our various ideas and perspectives. And so it's okay to have questions and different opinions and share those because we really learn from each other when we do that. And the last part of our bond of union is this. We promise as members of this church to walk together as Christians, seeking to live according to the spirit and teachings of Jesus as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. In the quest of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of humanity. We learn from the Bible about God and Jesus, and we do our best to follow him together, as I said a minute ago. And two of the important things that we do as church together are worship and serve others. Maybe you remember that when we walk into church over the door, it says, enter to worship. And when we walk out of church, it says, depart to serve. Those are two important things we do because it's all about our relationship with God and with our neighbors and how we love God and love our neighbors. So worship and service go hand in hand and are very important in our walk with God. So that's a little bit about our bond of union here in this church that I'd like you to think about this week. And as always, wherever this week takes you, may God's love surround you and know that ours sure does too. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Today is the eighth in our Best of Bayshore series, where I will be highlighting some of the best of the best musical selections from our adult, youth, and children's singing and bell choirs that we've recorded in our online worship services. Today's anthem is Celtic Communion by Mark Hayes, which was seen in our World Communion Sunday worship service on October 4th, 2020. 
This beautiful anthem pairs a beloved Gaelic melody with the hymn Bread of the World and a quote from St. Patrick's Breastplate, incorporating this well-known prayer for divine protection attributed to one of Ireland's most beloved saints. You'll hear the Irish folk flavor enhanced by our guest instrumentalist Kathleen Dyer and Amanda Duncan. On this Lenten Communion Sunday, allow this song to inspire your day. Will you please join with me now in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, we are so grateful for your ever-present love in our lives. In this time of worship, prayer, and reflection, may we quiet the busyness of our minds, release the frenzy of our worries, and open our hearts to your caring presence. And may we listen for your Spirit's call to us this day. Amen. Imagine you were in Jerusalem in the first century. Like so many others, including Jesus and his disciples, perhaps you are a Jewish pilgrim who has traveled from your hometown or village to this special city in order to take part in the festival of Passover. Maybe you've been there before. Maybe you go every year, or perhaps this is your first trip. When you arrive, you know that part of the observance of this holiday is to find your way up to the temple to make an offering. It's a common practice in general when one makes the trip to Jerusalem. What you find when you get to the Temple Mount is a huge structural complex. It's not just one building. 
and a busy, loud, bustling scene. The outer courtyard is filled with vendors selling sheep and cattle and doves for sacrificial offerings. The money changers are there also to change any currency from the various corners of the empire and beyond into the Tyrian shekel, the coin one must use to pay the temple tax. And it's crowded. It's Passover, so it's like a Disneyland on a summer busy weekend. This was the second temple built on this site, by the way. Solomon's was the first. This one was constructed during the reign of Herod the Great. And John's gospel tells us it's been under construction for 46 years by the time Jesus shows up. In addition to being an important religious site in Judaism, the Jerusalem temple was also a popular tourist attraction in its day. Along with Jewish pilgrims and the priests who served at the temple to facilitate offerings, Gentiles went there too, some just to check it out and some to offer their own prayers. And surely there were some Roman guards posted there as well for crowd control, especially at Passover. And then Jesus shows up, looking like any other Jewish pilgrim until he starts disrupting things and causing a scene. John's telling of this temple incident is the most colorful. Not only does Jesus turn over the tables of the money changers and pour out their coins and tell the vendors to get out, but he also makes a whip of cords and drives out the livestock. You can imagine the sheep and cattle running away, the vendors chasing after them, the money changers angrily cleaning up the mess, and people shocked at this behavior. Take these things out of here, he says to the dove sellers. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. In the other gospels, but not in John, Jesus paraphrases the prophet Jeremiah saying, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. It's quite the spectacle Jesus has caused. And as it turns out, it may have been the thing that ended up getting him into trouble with both the temple authorities and the Romans. So why did he do it? Did Jesus just lose his temper? Probably not. Was he against animal sacrifice? There's not really any clear evidence for that notion. Was it because the vendors were price gouging? Because the money changers were extorting the public by offering lousy exchange rates so they could make some cash? Some of that could have been happening. People do that kind of thing sometimes. But there's no clear evidence that it was a widespread problem. Though we can't fully read Jesus' mind, Probably the best answer we have to the question of why he did this is that it was an act of prophetic teaching and witness. A number of biblical scholars see it this way. And we know that prophets make scenes sometimes in order to make a point. Jesus, like the Hebrew prophets that came before him, was concerned with integrity. We also know that Jesus was concerned with the plight of the poor and suffering. Had typical temple worship lost its relevance and depth? Had typical temple worshipers forgotten that ritual and worship must always go hand in hand with loving and serving one's neighbor? Had some of the temple authorities become so enmeshed with the Roman Empire that they were actively contributing to the oppression of their own people? Probably, to some degree, all of those things were happening. For centuries, the prophets had been calling their people to the integrity of faith in worship and practice. Consider that familiar passage from the prophet Micah, which is also quoted in our Bashar Church Bond of Union. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you 
but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. We're familiar with Micah's point. Other prophets, including Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, and Jeremiah, all made the same point. God doesn't want empty worship. God doesn't want us to just go through the motions. When the practice of faith becomes devoid of those three important things that Micah lists, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God, then something's wrong. Something is amiss and needs to be corrected. Religion becomes disingenuous and even harmful, and it's missing the heart and soul of a faith that fiercely loves both God and neighbor. Might Jesus, standing in the company of prophets like Micah, have felt compelled to enact a public prophetic witness to draw attention to these issues? I think so. It wasn't that Jesus was necessarily against the temple structure, against the sacrificial rituals and other worship practices, the priests, the vendors, the pilgrims, but perhaps he wanted to get their attention. And I think that is because he wanted to draw them back to the very heart of their faith. That's what good prophets do. It's what good prophets have always done. After this incident, Jesus would continue to teach in the temple. It certainly appears that he wanted the temple to be a place of prayer and spiritual nourishment and learning and public service. So I don't think he wanted to destroy it, even as he was critical of the way it was functioning in his day. I think he wanted to resurrect its ministry. In John's telling of this story, another theological point is being made as well. First off, John uses this episode to foreshadow Jesus' death and resurrection. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, Jesus says. This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days, his critics reply. But he was speaking of the temple of his body, John tells us. For John, Jesus is the temple. If we want to find God's presence on earth, we look to Jesus. As you remember from the opening of John's gospel, Jesus is the word made flesh who lived among us. Jesus is God's self-revelation of love. John knew that temples would rise and fall. The one in Jerusalem would fall too, just a few decades after Jesus' life. But the presence of God in Christ could not be destroyed or defeated by the most powerful people in this world. This story invites a lot of interesting questions for us to reflect upon for ourselves. One is that question of integrity and wholeness in our practice of faith. How do our acts of prayer and worship go hand in hand with our acts of service, compassion, and justice seeking? How are we living out those three important mandates Micah emphasizes of doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God? We learn from the witness of Jesus and the prophets who came before him that all of these things are part of a cohesive and integrated practice of faith. They are not so separate from one another. None of this is new, of course, but we all need reminding now and then. In a way, Jesus cleaned house that day at the temple, symbolically anyway. In reality, it sounds like he kind of made a mess. But the point was to call people back to the central focus of their faith, loving God and loving their neighbor. And so this story also invites us to consider how we might wish to clean our own spiritual houses and how we might ask for God's help with that. Perhaps you stopped by the prayer station last weekend that some of our worship commission members set up on the front steps, and maybe you asked yourself that very question. If so, I hope that was a meaningful experience for you. Sometimes we need to let go of some things in order to make more room in our hearts for God's grace to fill us. Is there anything cluttering your heart today 
that you need to give over to God. Worries, fears, doubts, self-criticism, anger, grudges, guilt. How do you need release? How does your spiritual center, the temple of your soul, need to be made clean once again? Truthfully, even though this idea of spiritual house cleaning is something we emphasize during the season of Lent, I think this is a constant process. It's kind of like actual house cleaning. In a way, it never ends, right? But that's okay because a messy house is one that has been lived in. And listening to our own hearts, both for what we need to give over to God and for where God's love and grace are in our lives, is also a way in which we really live into our spiritual home, really live into our relationship with God. And in addition to our personal spiritual lives, this story also invites us to consider this question as the church in the world. This was a public display Jesus enacted at a public place of worship. So how does our corporate practice of faith as the church in the broader world focus on what is most important? Do we need to do any decluttering? Are there things that have gotten in our way that we need to clean up or clear out in order to more fully and more faithfully live into our calling as the church? The late author and religious commentator Phyllis Tickle wrote about how every 500 years or so, Christianity has a rummage sale in which the church examines itself, throws out some things that no longer serve people or function well, and makes some changes. The Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation of the 16th century was the last big Christianity rummage sale. And Tickle made the case that we are now in the midst of another one, as we wait to see how the church of the 21st century will unfold and what it will emerge to be. She called this the great emergence. Though the big shifts may only happen every few centuries, in reality, this is always happening in smaller ways. Just as our individual spirituality is always evolving and growing throughout our lifelong journeys of faith, the church in every generation is also growing and evolving too. So it's always worth paying attention to voices both within and outside of the church or outside of our familiar practices and traditions. Those folks might have something important to say to us. In my experience, both young people and people whose backgrounds and experiences are different from our own have a lot to teach me about how to be the church in ways that are new to me. Even if what another person has to say is unfamiliar or seems different to us, we might just learn something new. And we never know what might end up being transformative and life-giving until we give it a try. And so, in both our personal and collective practices of faith, let us be open to a little spiritual house cleaning. Let us be unafraid to make a little room for the fresh air of the Holy Spirit to come rushing in, and for God's love to fill us in new and profound ways. It's all an ever-evolving, unfolding journey, after all. And let us remember that what God really desires from us is simple. God hopes that we live out our faith by doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. Amen.
please join with me now in a moment of prayer. Creator God, we thank you for calling this beautiful world into being, for calling us into life, for setting us on this path of discipleship, for inviting us into relationship with you and with our neighbors near and far. We thank you for your steadfast love that uplifts and carries us through all of life's ups and downs. As we turn to you in prayer in this moment, we lift up to you all those who are in need, those who are sick and suffering, those who are grieving, those who are caring for others, those who are without homes and jobs, those who are facing uncertainty. And we pray that your deep compassion, your healing presence, your love will enfold all those who are in need of it in this moment. And we pray that you continue to inspire and empower us and guide us with your wisdom to be of service to our neighbors, to bear your compassion and healing and love into the world in the ways that we can, to the people we meet in our daily living, and to our neighbors across the globe. May you continue to guide us in this work. God, it is with thanksgiving for your grace and your wisdom that we offer all of the prayers of our hearts to you with our trust in your goodness and grace. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we remember as we gather once again at this table that when Jesus was in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, he too gathered with his friends in the upper room to celebrate that special meal. And as they remembered that story of Moses leading the Israelites to freedom from Pharaoh, 
they gathered to take part in that feast of liberation. And that is what we do at this table each time we gather to remember Jesus and to live into his call to loving service and ministry. While Jesus was eating with his disciples, he took bread from the table and giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it. And he offered it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup from the table and he offered it to them and said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious God, may you pour out your Holy Spirit upon these simple elements of bread and cup so that they might become for us nourishment on the journey, reminders of your love and grace in our midst. And may they fill us, inspire us, and give us the strength and energy for the work ahead. Amen. Friends, this is the bread of life and the cup of grace for you.
For our offertory today, our bell quartet will be ringing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, a hymn tune melody used by Johann Sebastian Bach in his monumental work, The St. Matthew's Passion. May it provide for you a moment of reflection on this Lenten path. We do thank you for your ongoing support of Bashar Church, your gifts to our ministries of worship and music, education and service in the broader world make a difference in the lives of others. Thank you. Let us now receive our offering. Will you please join with me now in our prayer of dedication? Our gifts offered here are but symbols of our whole lives, which we seek to offer in service to you, O God. May all our work, both within the church and out in the world, be holy offerings acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's final hymn was written by a congregational pastor who was also a church historian, chaplain, librarian, and director of music. Eric Routley wrote this hymn in the latter half of the 20th century, focusing on ministry in an urban context and the idea that our goal is to become more Christ-like in the way we love our neighbors and meet the needs of those around us. Let us sing. Oh 
go forth into this week to love and serve your neighbors near and far. May you go trusting in God's steadfast love to uphold you. And may the peace of Christ sustain you and the power of the Holy Spirit inspire you now and forevermore. Amen. For the third postlude in our Lenten organ series, I have selected a powerful piece by Olivier Messiaen, who lived from 1908 to 1992. It's entitled Design Eternel. Messiaen was a French mystic known for his deep faith and his groundbreaking innovations in harmony that actually influenced the direction of Western music. He traveled the world notating bird calls and researching ancient Indian and Greek rhythms, which heavily influenced his writing. He invented his own scales and harmonic structures based upon them. And although they may first be strange to our ears, a friend of mine who had a near-death experience told me that Messian's music was more like what he heard over there. So maybe Messian was onto something. Most of his works are sacred, and this particular piece entitled Eternal Designs is inspired by the following scripture. It's notated actually on, on the score. God in his love has predestined us to be his adoptive sons by Jesus Christ to the praise and glory of his grace. In other words, God's eternal design. Like many of his works, this piece is a meditation meant to transport us to a place of quiet with our God. So as you listen, consider that you are the adoptive child of God and your life has eternal design. Mm -hmm. 